Aha, all right. Well, some of you who know me know that I'm technically incompetent, so it's not unusual for these kinds of things to happen, and because I don't know how anything works, you know? In fact, uh, I'm one of those people at the office when something goes wrong, they tell me to just step away from the computer. Actually, you could go home for a while and come back, you know? Don't touch anything. So thank you for being patient with my technical challenges. So I am Pam Popper from Columbus, Ohio, founder and executive director of Wellness Form Health, and we specialize in informed medical decision making. And what that means is knowing the risks and benefits about the things that you're intending to do or contemplating doing in healthcare. That's diets, supplements, drugs, screening tests, procedures, and knowing those risks and benefits before you decide to act. And if people would do that, if they would buy healthcare, the way, they, the way that they buy cars and houses and blenders and washing machines and college educations for their kids and retirement accounts, we could clean up the healthcare crisis by five o'clock today. Because if people actually looked at the information, if they considered the evidence before they took action, probably two thirds of healthcare would go away. Most of the food companies would be out of business and we wouldn't have to hear about the paleo and the keto diet every day on Facebook and Twitter and social media, right? So unfortunately, people don't do that right now because they don't know that they're supposed to. How many of you at one time, and maybe sometimes you're going through this process right now, but how many of you at some point in time thought that your doctor knew best? Anybody? Did what your doctor said, right? And you probably have friends who still feel that way, that the doctor who's head of the department at the local university medical center certainly knows what he or she is talking about and following his or her direction is the best thing to do. And that's how people get hurt. So stop looking for nutritional gurus, medical gurus, start learning how to look at information and filter it for yourself. So my talk today is on diet, exercise, and, and mental health. And I'll start by telling you a little bit about my inspiration. So um, many years ago, uh, I realized, I've, I've always been very careful about scope of practice and what I know about and what I don't know about. And when people would bring up depression or anxiety, or I noticed that they were taking drugs like Prozac or Xanax, I really didn't talk about it very much. I didn't think it was my area of expertise. And once in a while, somebody would ask me, like, I'm really feeling depressed, what should I do? And I would refer them, I'd tell, say, look in your insurance guide, you know, they'll have a psychologist or a psychiatrist you can go and see. And I really didn't realize how dangerous that advice was at the time. But one day when I was running, and by the way, I'm, I love running, and it's when I get all my great ideas, and if my knees go out, we have to close the company, I think. But I was out running one day, and I had this epiphany. It's like nobody who's depressed or anxious or whatever's going on with them, they just don't seem to get better. Years of therapy, years of drugs. I never knew anybody who was coming off of their drugs, only going on drugs. And so I thought to myself, what if the mental health business is like the cardiology business, it's like the endocrinology business, it's like all the other branches of healthcare where there's something out there that works. Like you could actually fix this problem the way that you can fix clogged arteries and blood glucose dysregulation and some of the other things that you've heard a lot about at this conference. So I started looking into it, and I found out that there were really good therapists out there who helped restore people back to psychological well-being and mental function. They didn't prescribe drugs. People actually got meaningfully better in a short period of time. And I found a therapist locally. I did a lot of searching to find this guy. And I said, we had a meeting, and we were on the same page on this issue and many other things. And so I gave him my books to read and my stuff, and he said, listen, if you want to learn about what I do, you should read Peter Bregan's books. I never heard of Peter Bregan. So I bought Peter Bregan's books. Peter Bregan's going to, you're going to hear from him today. He's in the front row. And I started reading them, and I was just astounded, absolutely astounded. Um, first of all, um, I've been telling the truth for a long time about healthcare. And um, as you have heard throughout this conference, there are a lot of consequences to being a truth teller. Apparently, that's a bad thing to do in some people's eyes. But, but um, Dr. Bregan, like me, has taken great risks to tell the truth about psychiatric drugs. Um, he's a psychiatrist who's been in practice for over 50 years and has never started a patient on psychiatric drugs, but instead does this incredible thing called talking to them. Who knew? You could talk to people and help them get better. You could show that you care and guide them through a process of finding out that they could make a better life for themselves. And that sounds like a whole lot better idea than drugging. 
So one day, I got my courage up and I called Dr. Bragan's house and I got his lovely wife, Ginger, who agreed that Dr. Bragan should speak at our conference and he did. Came to, that was 2012. And over time, we became very good friends and decided that our work was very compatible and that we should be offering mental health programs at Wellness Forum Health. And so that was the beginning of really taking a deep dive into this topic of mental health and psychological health and what's really going on with people and, and that sort of thing. So with that, we'll go on ahead and get started. Um, the first thing is if we're going to apply the, the uh, informed decision-making model uh, to mental health, the first thing I need to tell you is there are no studies showing that there's a chemical imbalance in the brain that causes any psychological disorder. And I'm only going to cover a couple of foundational things because I have to make something really clear to you before I start talking about diet and exercise. Um, there's no way to measure neurotransmitters in the brain like serotonin. In fact, um, the studies that have shown that there is a neurotransmitter deficiency have been done on animals who appear depressed. And I've always wondered how you look at a rat and determine that the rat is depressed. But anyway, people claim to be able to do this and they find that the serotonin levels are low, but you can't do that to humans. Um, according to a psychiatrist in the UK, he says, indeed, no abnormality of serotonin in depression has ever been demonstrated. So fortunately, there are some psychiatrists who've always spoken out about this issue, Dr. Bragan. There are some psychiatrists who are starting to try to come clean with this issue that we've drugged about 25% of the population in the United States without reason. And Dr. Ronald Pies, who was a psychiatrist at Tufts University and former editor of Psychiatric Crimes, says, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always kind of an urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. He actually said this on an NPR interview. Well, an urban legend that resulted in 25% of the country being drugged, that's pretty astounding when you think about it. Well, when pressed further, he goes on to say, my impression is that most psychiatrists who use this expression feel uncomfortable and a little embarrassed when they do so. It's kind of a bumper sticker phrase that saves time and allows the physician to write out that prescription while feeling that the patient has been educated. That's interesting. And then he went on to say a little later, it was a little white lie. Well, I think it was a ginormous white lie if you ask my opinion about it. So what psychiatrists have told Americans is that the drugging of people in the United States has led to better outcomes. But one in six adults right now in the United States reports taking at least one psychiatric drug. 84.3% of the people use them long term, and they were never designed for long term use. An analysis of 522 trials involving 21 antidepressant drugs with 116,000 plus patients showed that the drugs were barely better than placebo. And so the public's been told that all this would make things better, but 850 adults and 250 children who take these drugs are placed on, the, on disability every day in the United States. That doesn't sound like things are getting better to me. Um, disease mongering is the, is the process of expanding the definition of disease so that you can treat more people. And this goes on in every branch of medicine, and psychology and psychiatry are no different. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual has grown from 30 diseases to almost 300. And some of the recent diseases that were added are caffeine withdrawal. You certainly need to be drugged for that. So, central sleep apnea, hoarding disorder, neurocognitive disorder. PMS, restless leg syndrome, and social communication disorder. I'm really interested in that one. What, how exactly do you define social communication disorder? And so my point in all of this is that these are not biological diseases. Shyness is now a disease. Grief is a disease. Almost any symptom that somebody has is a disease. And so this results in a 50% chance that if you say the right thing to the right doctor, you could be a di diagnosed as having a mental disorder and placed on drugs. Not good. Doctors in all medical specialties are prescribing the drugs. It's not just psychiatrists. And many patients aren't depressed or anxious. They're malnourished, dehydrated, and sedentary, and the symptoms are similar to depression. So you take short visits with family practice doctors and OB-GYNs and others who people see. And here's the conversation, I think, as it happens. And so there's some research to, to document what I'm saying. Is the doctor says, how are you doing? The patient says, not so good. You know, I'm getting divorced. and. I'm having to move and the kids aren't doing so well. It's a very stressful time. I'm having trouble sleeping. And it all starts to sound like depression, all right? So here's some Prozac. But actually, if you don't eat well and you're hypoglycemic and you're dehydrated and you're overweight and you um, eat terrible food, that can cause exactly those same symptoms. You know, I don't feel like doing anything. I'm having trouble sleeping at night. I don't have any energy. 
And some of these symptoms start to sound the same as depression. So I'm convinced that one of the things that's happened is that doctors who've been trained to look for depression, there was just an article in the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, journal um, teaching pediatricians that they need to be more mindful of identifying depressed um, children and adolescents so that they can be drugged. Okay, so doctors are being told you should look out for this, mental illness is an epidemic, watch out for this in your patients so that you can take care of them and keep them from going downhill. So what happens is medications prescribed for people who are just having everyday stress or who are just, you know, just dehydrated, sedentary, overweight, and eating terrible food. Um, almost every negative thought emotion that people have is considered pathology requiring treatment. The standard of care is drugs. And this ignores the thought that um, the diet and exercise and physical health could have something to do with mental health. But, um, but I want to be crystal clear, and one of the reasons I wanted to give you this background is that I don't want anybody to misconstrue the things that I'm going to tell you as saying that mental health or mental health issues or psychological issues are biological in nature. They're not. What I'm telling you is that the way that you take care of yourself and your state of health can contribute to your state of, of your mental state and your psychological state. And that you can make things better, not only by getting the right therapy, but by taking care of yourself. One of the problems is drugs are easy to prescribe, not very easy to deprescribe, and it's very difficult for people to withdraw from them. So you'll hear more about this from Dr. Bragan, but the brain adapts to the drugs, it starts to function differently. Withdrawal produces dangerous, sometimes, symptoms. The brain can be very slow to, damp to recover from the damage from the drugs. Uh, judgment and self-control can be impaired. Severe depression, mania, psychosis can result. And the original person, or the original problem for which the person was drugged comes back with a vengeance in many instances because it hasn't been dealt with while the person has been drugged. So many prescribers don't know how dangerous the drugs are. They don't know how to take people off the drugs. It's easier to find people to prescribe them than deprescribe. Withdrawal is complicated. A team approach works best. You're going to hear about all of this from Dr. Bregan. Building a strong body through diet and lifestyle change can lessen the effects of withdrawal. It doesn't take away the effects of withdrawal. And it's not a solution for people who are clinically depressed, clinically anxious. It just makes it easier. And there's a significant body of evidence showing that diet and exercise contribute to mental health. So when I started looking in the medical literature, I was hoping I could find a little bit of documentation for what I'm telling you. Because I've seen this in my own practice, where people say, um, you know, that they're, they come in, they're eating a terrible diet, they're dehydrated, they're overweight, and they're sedentary. And they start exercising, they lose weight, they eat better, and they say, you know, I feel better. I have more energy. I'm doing a lot more things than I used to. I don't go home and just lay on the couch. I feel like going to the gym and going out with friends. And, and so you see their mood change, all right? And so I've seen this in my own practice. So I was hoping I would be able to find something that would, would document this in the medical literature. And it was astounding what I was able to find. In fact, the historical perspective, this goes back several centuries. Ludwig Feuerbach said, what, what, one is what one eats. We are what we eat. The use of food to address psychological disorders dates back thousands of years. Ayurveda, Ayurvedic medicine historically has used plant foods and herbs to regulate mood and psychological treatments. Um, it included medical, uh, medicinal plants like pepper, valerian, turmeric, curcumin, pomegranate, cinnamon, sandalwood, garlic, radish. Um, Indian snake root was used to treat insanity. Um, and this goes back thousands of years. You know, sometimes we've known what the, the answer is for a long time. We just have chosen not to, to act on it. Um, today, in fact, there are lower rates of depression, anxiety, and psychosis in populations of people who eat more of a plant-based diet. You sure have been hearing a lot about the benefits of a plant-based diet when it applies to diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and autoimmune diseases and that sort of thing, but we see the same effect here.